very welcome to this series of pre-scene analysis videos covering SEMA's November 2018 operational case study. The pre-scene material that SEMA has created for this round is based on a fictional company by the name of Jim Fit. And over the course of the coming videos, we will be looking at each and every page of the pre-scene document, talking about um, its importance in relation to the operational case study exam, going through potential exam issues, as well as linking the information in the pre-scene to a lot of the theories you would have covered during your E1, P1, and F1 studies. So, Looking at the very first page from the pre-scene, we're presented with an extract from the job description. You're told that you're a finance officer for Jim Fit and that your role entails supporting Stephen Potter. He's a finance manager, likely someone you will be dealing with quite a bit on the day of the exam. You likely receive uh, triggers in the form of emails, for example, from Stephen, asking you for uh, support of various kinds. Your tasks then, as a finance officer, include the following, the production of the annual budget, uh, producing monthly management accounts, and providing ma information to management as required. And on top of that, you're expected to assist with the preparation of financial statements and deal with any queries coming up relating to financial reporting. So, in other words, you can expect anything on exam day relating to what you've studied in E1, P1 and F1. So, uh, it's not really narrowing it down in this job description, unfor unfortunately. So, you need to be prepared for anything on exam day. Reporting, payroll issues, uh, anything related to receivables, payables, etc. It's important to point out that at the operational level, you're more assisting the, de the decision makers uh, in the company. So you are helping people like Stephen out. He's a manager, but you might even be interacting with senior managers, uh, maybe even some directors as well. And your job is to make their life uh, easier. So they'll be coming to you uh, with uh, details taken from, for example, reports, uh, financial statements, etc. And they'll be asking you to shed light on the uh, information that they present you with. And then they'll go and take uh, a, a decision based on the uh, the feedback that you give them. So you're not actually going to be the person who's making strategic decisions for the company, but you'll certainly be expected to inform the decision makers, the strategic decision makers uh, of the best course uh, of action. A lot of people ask about the operational case study and the number of calculations you might need to perform, etc. Um, you're not going to have to do any detailed calculations as you would in your objective uh, tests, but you will certainly need to be familiar with all of the technical uh, issues you'd have covered in E1, P1 and F1. So it's more the case that you would be presented with a table of calculations and you'll have to look out for incorrect assumptions or incorrect calculations and things like that rather than going and making detailed calculations yourself. Having said that, a big part of this particular uh, case studies marks go on technical skills. For the case study exam, the uh, marks are allocated over four skill sets. One is related to technical skills, another is related to business skills, another is related to people skills, and finally you have leadership skills. So people and leadership skills become more important as you move up through the levels to management case study and strategic case study. They're less important at the operation level where the focus is still on technical skills in a big way. So what that means is that you'll be getting plenty of uh, tables, figures presented to you. As I say, you're not the one doing the calculations, but there will be plenty of uh, tables and figures presented to you. And you'll be expected certainly uh, to recall from your objective studies how uh, how those uh, different uh, theories, etc., and how the figures relate uh, to what's been mentioned in the exam. So, 
I want to discuss the finance role in a little bit more detail before we move on. Uh, the finance officer role more specifically. So you're still pretty low down the food chain, so to speak, in this company. As you move up through the levels with SEMA, you'll occupy a, a managerial role at the management uh, case study. And at the top level, the strategic level, you'll likely be a senior finance manager and you'll be interacting with the most important people at the company. But uh, first things first, operational case study, you're still lower down the food chain, as I said, so you're a, a relatively lowly finance officer. And the role that you have at Gym Fit will likely entail the following uh, big themes. So first of all, you're going to have a short-term focus. So we're talking about issues that will be presented to you on exam day that likely have a time horizon of about three to six months, maybe 12 months maximum. That changes, for example, uh, as you move up through the levels with SEMA. At a strategic, a strategic level, you will be the one actually informing and taking strategic decisions yourself for the company. So you'll be looking at a long time horizon, uh, decisions that impact the company over three to five years, for example. But that's not the case with the operational case study. So it's going to be about the operations of the company, day-to-day -day execution of tasks. Costing is going to be important, as well as budgeting. We'll be presented with the budget for 2018 later in this pre-scene. So uh, it's likely as well that something could come up uh, in relation to the way that this company is doing its budgeting. We're told later that, for example, that they have an incremental budget. So I wouldn't be surprised to see something come up on exam day uh, asking for a comparison versus other budgeting methods like zero-based budgeting or something like that. And you might even get something on traditional absorption costing, which this company seems to be employing uh, compared to activity-based costing and weighing up the pros and cons of each and making a recommendation on what uh, which system this company should use. Related then to budgets, uh, you might well be presented with a variance analysis report looking at sales taken from a report compared to the budgeted sales. For example, you'd be asked to comment on any price variances, volume variances, etc. Uh, working capital management is going to be uh, important as well well as you look at the current assets and current liabilities of the company and interestingly we're going to see when we look at the financial statements for Jim Fit that their current liabilities far exceed their current assets. This is a company that struggles a little bit with liquidity and we'll talk about some of the uh, problems that that entails later on. Cash management is going to be important. Again, as I said, liquidity is a little bit of a problem for Gym Fit as it tries to expand aggressively and open new gyms. And what that has meant in the last year is that its cash position has been eroded quite dramatically. And you'll be expected to assess risk over the short term, 3 to 12 months maximum. On the next page, we're presented with the background of the company. And the good news is that Gym Fit is fast growing and it's a leading provider of low cost gyms. In fact, it's one of the pioneers of the low cost gym model in its home market. And um, the deal with the low cost gym model is that it takes a no frills service approach you think of these low-cost, no-frills companies in other industries, such as the airline industry, very famously Ryanair and EasyJet, for example, have come and disrupted the airline industry over the last 30 or so years. In fashion, you have a company like Zara with its uh, low-cost, no-frills approach to fashion, uh, having disrupted the fashion industry quite dramatically also over the last 20 or so years. And in the supermarket space, you have companies like Lidl and Aldi. They've made great waves with a more stripped-back offer, but not necessarily a lower-quality offer, and they've taken on some of the giants of the supermarket industry. So uh, Jim Fit is in line with that no-frills, uh, get-the-basics-right approach, 
and is tr- and has succeeded it seems in disrupting the health and fitness uh, market in its home country of Keltland. Keltland, we're told, is in Europe. We're not told too much more uh, later in the pre-scene. Actually, we do have a little bit of detail that leads us to estimate the number of inhabitants in Celtland or Keltland. It's quite a big European country. It's 60, 68 million, I think, is the uh, population. We'll talk about that later on. So quite a big European country, certainly. So Jim Fit. A pioneer in low-cost gyms has now got 102 gyms and it's serving almost half a million members, so it seems to be quite big. It was founded 13 years ago in 2005 and was backed then by a venture capitalist firm by the name of Land Ventures. So the venture capital firms, they like to take a stake in a potentially high-growth company Uh, and they like to get a very high return for the amount that they put in. We're not sure whether Land Venture still holds a stake in uh, in Jim Fit. It's not mentioned later on, but what is certain is that uh, the company was listed on the Keltland Stock Exchange uh, in later years, and uh, it is using the C dollar, that's its home currency. There aren't really going to be big issues uh, in terms of exchange rates, etc., because uh, Jim Fit is operating only in its home country of Keltland. Um, so a low-cost, no-frills approach, as I said, uh, we were reminded here of Porter's generic strategies, which, which you would have come across in your E1 studies. Certainly, you would say Jim Fit is going to want to position itself as a cost leader with a broad cost focus. They're going to want to attract as many members as they possibly can, get them into the gyms, they'll charge them a low fee, but their overall revenues would be high because they've got so many members, half a million almost, as we said. So they've a broad market and their emphasis is less on a very, very high quality offer uh, and more on keeping costs low and keeping prices low for their uh, core Uh, market. That is not necessarily to say, though, that they will be offering low quality. And in fact, there are plenty of suggestions throughout the the rest of this section that they do have a focus on having quality machines, etc. in their gyms. Just a word then on Keltland. Um, Because it's based in Europe, we can probably uh, estimate that it's relatively wealthy and that's obviously a good thing it means that um, the consumers in Keltland likely have a good degree of purchasing power so they can uh, spend on um, on their pastimes like going to the gym etc but it will also have an impact on staff costs they'll be a little bit higher than they would be in other markets perhaps as we move down through the uh, this page, we're presented with a table showing the revenues as they have grown from 2012 to 2017. Certainly a very positive um, trend, upward trend here. Um, we're told that sales have grown f- from 17.8 million in 2012 to 73.1 million in 2017. That represents four times uh, revenue growth. And that's actually very much in line with the growth in the number of gyms that they've opened uh, in that same period. In that same period, the the gyms have grown from 26 gyms to 102 gyms in 2017. So that is 3.9 times uh, gym growth over that period, which is almost exactly in line with their revenue growth. Now, what that means is that Rather than price increases driving their revenue growth, uh, it is volumes, the number of people coming into the gyms that's driving revenue growth. So they've likely been holding their prices pretty flat over that five-year period, um, but what's driven the revenue growth is the opening of a new gym. So it's going to be very key to the future revenue growth of the company that they keep opening new gyms. And we can ask the question now whether that Uh, kind of aggressive uh, gym opening uh, growth is sustainable in this market. And actually, there are plenty of suggestions in this pre-scene that certainly over the mid-term, that will be possible. So a word in this growth, um, there's an average of 33% revenue growth per year over this period. So that's about 11 million uh, per year in uh, revenue growth. Very healthy, it seems. 
The projected 2018 revenue growth, which we will see later in the budgeting section, uh, revenues are projected to grow by 19 million, which will represent 26% growth in 2018 compared to 2017. So very much in line with the, the kinds of high growth figures that the company's been seeing been seeing since 2012. So very positive uh, revenue uh, trends, it seems. Now, I just want to jump back to a word on the fact that the, uh, that uh, this company, GymFit, is listed on the stock exchange. There are certainly big benefits that come with being a listed company. You have more financing options. You can tap into equity funding. You can go, go to shareholders um, and issue more shares should, should you need to expand and open more gyms, for example. And there are reputational benefits with coming that come with being a listed company as well. Everyone knows your name. The investment community knows about you. They know that there are rigorous um, checks, etc., that come with being a listed company. You have to publish your accounts every quarter, and they are subject to the, to the scrutiny of investment analysts, etc. So you have your house in order. But those kinds of um, that kind of um, scrutiny uh, presents challenges as well. It's uh, costly and time consuming to get your house in order, to produce these accounts on a quarterly basis uh, and to meet the expectations of shareholders in the uh, investment communities. And there's constant pressure from shareholders uh, that they want to return on their investments uh, too. So pros and cons, but probably overall, it's quite a positive thing that this company is listed on the stock exchange. So, the way that the company has grown in the past is through a mixture of organic growth and acquisition of other gyms. So, we would ask how they have financed that in the past and how they can, can continue to finance that. They had a venture capital firm uh, uh, backing them at the start. We're not, we're not sure if that venture capital firm sold all of its stake when they listed on the stock exchange or not, or they retained some uh, holding still. Um, but there certainly is a question as to how best they should finance their uh, ongoing opening of new gyms. And the company is becoming more highly indebted. We'll see that when we look at the financial statements later. So it might be a challenge for them to go on um, growing so aggressively. Uh, presently, this is the second largest operator of low-cost gyms in Keltland. So pretty well positioned in its market. GymFit's business model then offers 24-7 uh, gym facilities. So it's open all the time. And that's certainly a plus to people who are looking for flexibility. You might have night shift workers, etc., uh, or people who can only get to the gym, uh, for example, late at night or very, very early in the morning. And that is very convenient for them. Uh, even more convenient, there's no contractual obligation for membership. You don't need to s sign up to a one-year contract where you're locked in to monthly payments uh, over that 12-month period. So no fixed membership period. So what we're seeing here is that there are very low barriers to joining uh, and to using the service. But on the flip side, there are also very low barriers to exiting. You can come along, sign up for a month, and then you can uh, skip along to another gym as soon as you get bored uh, of gym fits facilities and services. So uh, pros and cons with this kind of approach. So in order to offer the low membership fees that they're offering and to get those volumes into their gyms, uh, the whole business is built on a no-frills concept. Now, that doesn't mean, mean low quality, for example, that I, I mentioned that before, um, because they uh, do put a lot of emphasis on high-quality facilities. The gym equipment is very good but there are no extras, such as wet facilities. In other words, uh, swimming pools, saunas, etc. There are no cafes and bars. All of those frills that come with more traditional health clubs. But certainly they need to get the basics right. It's good that they've put an emphasis on uh, having high quality machines, etc. Because certainly nowadays, consumers in general are more demanding than ever. They expect a minimum level of quality, even if they're paying uh, very low prices. And another important uh, core element of GymFit's offer 
is the technology they use, very, very advanced. Uh, and this uh, technological excellence means that the uh, whole process from start to finish, it seems, is um, very reliant on their technology. But it also kind of simplifies and makes more convenient the whole process for Gym Fit members because you can go online and join up there. That You don't need to go along to the gym and uh, form, uh, form a queue and wait uh, quite some time for someone to attend to your uh, needs as you want to sign up, etc. And you manage your account online. You can view class timetables online and book a class online as well. So what I would say, though, is that once you go to all that hassle of signing up, um, you're certainly li less likely to leave uh, suddenly. So it does need to be, while it needs to be convenient, it's good that it takes a little bit of time and it's a little bit onerous to go about signing up to use GymFit service because as we were talking about before, barriers to exit uh, are uh, heightened a little bit there. You're not likely to skip around from one gym to the next if there is a little bit of uh, work required to go and sign up uh, and to fill out forms online. Um, also, there's a benefit as well as having a, a more convenient sign-up process and um, uh, providing a service um, that is more convenient for uh, their customers. There are cost considerations with the technology. On the one hand, you're likely to have to make big capital expenditure investments. On the other hand, you have less of a need for dedicated in-gym in -gym sales teams, etc. You're not going to have to have as big a need for, uh, s uh, for staff in the gym in the gyms you have um, managing people coming in looking to sign up etc and um, it's likely as well that this kind of um, gym is going to be very appealing to younger uh, people because they're uh, quite comfortable with using technology and as well as that they're likely less likely to have um, a lot of spending power so students younger people etc and another thing i would just mention is that this is a volume business. They want to get as many people in the doors as possible. And that's great for the, uh, for the uh, top line, the revenue growth, etc. But they need to manage that uh, with the uh, customer experience. They need to balance that out. Because if you have gyms that are very, very overcrowded, they become very unpleasant indeed. And that could contribute to higher levels of turnover with their customers. The membership section then on the next page tells us that there is no fixed membership period, as we mentioned before, so you're free to cancel their, your membership at any time without a penalty. And I would say that it's worth Jim Fit considering offering maybe another uh, option where you do sign up for a fixed period, a six-month period, for example, or a 12-month period, um, and the overall, the monthly rate then is reduced. And in that way, they could lock in recurring monthly uh, payments and re revenues would become more predictable. And you mightn't have the same uh, churn rate, the number of people dropping out after a month or two, which seems to be a problem, not just for gym fit, but for low cost gyms in general. Uh, at the moment, they have three types of membership. They have a solo gym membership, a two gym membership, and a bundle membership. Because they have gyms throughout the country of Keltland, uh, with a solo membership, you can only go to the gym where you sign up. Uh, with two gyms, a member, two gym membership, you pay a little bit more, presumably, and you can access any two gyms that you want. With a bundle membership, uh, you pay a little bit more, presumably, and you can access any of their gyms uh, throughout the country. I would say, uh, I would ask how appealing this uh, these higher tier offers are um, with the bundle membership presumably you would pay a little bit more and the typical profile for someone like uh, that would sign up to a bundle membership would be your business traveler for example uh, where they might be traveling around the country a lot and they would like to access gyms and it's great that gym fit has a lot of reach throughout the country but Business travelers uh, tend to stay in hotels that already have gyms. So that's why I'm asking why, who would this bundle membership appeal to? So maybe they want to rethink their offering, move away from these bundled offers, etc. 
and moved to uh, locking in customers for fixed membership terms, six months to 12 months, uh, as I said, to uh, lock people in, decrease the uh, turnover rate for customers, which is a problem for low cost gyms. Um, so there's a monthly fee payable for those three membership tiers, solo, two gym and bundles. Alternatively, people can opt for a daily pass. Um, so um, that's an option too. Membership fees, we're told here, though, do vary depending on the location of the gym. That's interesting. It makes me think that you could, if you were very clever, go along and sign up at a lower cost gym in the countryside somewhere or in a small town, even if you're from the city, for example, uh, in a lower, in a higher cost gym location. And if, for example, you went for the two gym membership, then you could just go to the higher cost city gym for the uh, having paid the lower price. So there might be a little bit of revenue leakage there. It's probably not um, a, a massive abuse that's taking place across the board but it's just something for the company to keep an eye on. Uh, membership fees vary depending on the location of the gym, as I said. Uh, there are occasional marketing campaigns offering discounts for students and things like that. Um, so one of the problems we'll see throughout the pre-scene is that for the low-cost gyms in particular, uh, they're becoming more and more popular. There's likely more and more competition, so it's becoming harder to stand out. So it's necessary to uh, launch these uh, marketing campaigns from time to time, which of course is, means that the company is incurring more cost. Each member, we're told, is provided with a PIN code to electronically access their gyms. And again, I would ask whether that PIN code is the right approach. It might be better to hand out a little plastic um, card or pass, for example, because a PIN code can be easily shared with friends and family members. So they might be losing revenues there too. It's something worth looking at. Uh, finally, the high quality fitness equipment, which I mentioned before, uh, so they get the basics right. Uh, they do offer some free fitness classes, but there are other classes such as Pilates, Yoga and Dance Fit that uh, are uh, offered for an additional fee. There's a free induction session for new members. Uh, but you can also, with, for an additional fee, uh, get uh, an individual um, individual sessions from fitness instructors. Um, the payments uh, to the instructors are borne by the customer directly. It's not the gym uh, paying that. Private. It's a private arrangement, as I said, between the gym member and the instructor. Um, so just a question here, who is liable if there's an injury or an accident on the premises due to bad advice, for example, that an instructor is given? Um, are the instructors vetted? That's something we could ask at an early stage. That question will be answered later on. And then there are some ancillary revenues coming from vending machines that sell protein shakes, etc. So I'd like to draw your attention to Porter's Five Forces, which you would have come across in your E1 studies. Um, the bargaining power, I think, of customers of low-cost gyms is likely to be quite high because they have, nowadays with the internet especially, access to lots of transparent pricing information. And as well as that, there are lots and lots of low-cost gyms. As we saw, the sign-up options are pretty pain-free. It's very easy to go along and sign up. And the barriers to exit, leave your gym, uh, you can do that very easily too. So you can switch gyms very, very easily. And it's worth bearing that in mind at this early stage. It's a, a challenge for low cost gyms. Over the next three pages, we'll see how the company's human resources are organized. So we start with this section on the staff. And we're told that the average number of employees in 2017 was 254. So a typical gym has two employees, a manager and an assistant manager, and they're in charge of running the gym, while the remaining staff then are located at head office, and they're spread amongst the administrative uh, roles of IT, HR, finance, marketing, etc., now, this core staff is complemented by a freelance group 
of fitness instructors. They're hired on zero hour contracts, so they don't have fixed long term contracts, presumably like the other employees. And they're paid low hourly rates, but they do supplement their income then with fees from individual coaching sessions that were mentioned before. So I just want to unpack a few of the uh, things that we've mentioned here. For example, first of all, a small to medium sized business in the UK would be typically be classed as a business with under 250 employees and we'll see that gym fit is right on the limit here they're just over that 254 employees in 2017 so it is just becoming a a big company but in fact it might be a good deal bigger than that even because of these freelance fitness instructors they have only two full-time fixed contract employees it seems at each gym Um, and uh, then they have these freelance fitness instructors so if they've got two uh, managers in the gym it might be uh, reasonable to think they might have uh, four or five uh, plus fitness instructors per gym uh, across about 102 uh, gyms in 2017. So you could be talking maybe 500 additional freelance fitness instructors on top of the 254 uh, fixed uh, long-term contract uh, employees. So a good deal bigger perhaps than they're, um, than we're told here. Um, so certainly they're becoming a big company um, and it seems they have about 204 gym staff, if we're talking about fixed staff, if you take those two employees per gym and multiply it by the 102 gyms that they had in 2017, which would mean that you have about 51 head office staff um, covering, covering those administrative jobs, IT, HR, finance, marketing, etc. And the zero-hour contracts is... Um, is is kind of um, is is opening the door perhaps to potential problems with these fitness instructors, um, and even it's opening the door to potential ethical issues. Zero hour contracts have attracted a lot of publicity in recent times, as the employment uh, scenario for young people in particular has not been too favorable over the last 10 or so years and doesn't look to be getting much better. Um, So uh, companies are often criticized for this kind of practice. Um, It could be that gym fit will attract negative attention um, and especially given the fact uh, that they have two tiers of employees, it seems here. Uh, They have their fixed uh, contract staff the 204 or 254 staff there that seem to be quite well looked after. We're told later that they're paid competitive rates. They uh, have pension schemes in place and even share uh, schemes in place for these employees. And then you have the poor uh, freelance fitness instructors who are just living from day to day. It doesn't really seem fair and will maybe lead to resentment as well uh, and bad morale, certainly amongst the fitness instructors and could lead to conflicts arising in the workplace. So I would say certainly keep an eye out on that. And if you're presented with ethical issues on exam day, uh, you really should bring in the SEMA code of ethics. Examiners really like to see that code utilized when you're presented with an ethical dilemma. Uh, and, you know, the company goes on to talk later about, you know, it's it's people being its key resource. That's quite, uh, quite a cliche for companies to talk about that now. And I'm not really sure that they're demonstrating that in practice. They can talk about all that, talk about that all they want. But if they have this underclass of freelance fitness instructors propping up their organization, Uh, you know, they're not really practicing what they preach. It's clear that their instructors are not considered a key asset um, and, uh, you know, they're not seen to be adding much value, obviously, and there's a very uh, big danger there of poor morale amongst these people and they're the ones facing the uh, public uh, along with the manager and, and assistant manager. 
So it's very uh, plausible that they would feel underappreciated. And it's also likely, I think, that they would that there would be high turnover rates amongst these fitness instructors. Um, and it's costly to constantly have to go out and try to find new trainers. After all, we're told that these uh, fitness instructors are trained fitness experts. They, they do have know-how uh, and presumably um, that know-how isn't um, isn't all that easy to come uh, to come across and it requires uh, some uh, training etc so you can't just pull in anyone off the street to be a fitness instructor so it might be costly to uh, replace these people and it might be worth looking at treating these employees a little bit better so that they stick around for longer so um as well as the fitness instructors uh, you know, uh, conducting induction sessions, etc., for uh, the new members and doing classes. They actually carry out simple preventative uh, maintenance of the equipment and they test it as well. And when it breaks down, sometimes they try to handle the basic um, repairs. And it might be that the company's trying to cut costs there to avoid having the maintenance company come in. They only get the maintenance company in for bigger repairs, it seems. Um, so they're trying to cut costs there. But what happens if you have one of the uh, fitness uh, instructors that are underqualified for um, repairing the machines? They don't repair a machine properly and an injury occurs. Again, you're inviting potential legal trouble uh, in that instance. So the big repairs, it seems, are uh, contracted out to a maintenance company. And, you know, you ask uh, how much wear and tear their machines are undergoing. Presumably more than for a high-end gym, which would have fewer members. But the deal with Gym Fit, of course, is that they want to get as many people in the door. That's going to lead to a higher rate of attrition for their uh, gym equipment. So presumably they're going to have to repair it more often. And it reminds us uh, of our F1 studies, IAS 16 property plant and equipment. You think of revenue expenditures uh, which relate to running uh, costs and these kinds of uh, ongoing repairs versus capital expenditure where you'd actually have to replace um, machines from time to time by new machines. Um, so in addition to the training that they do and the induction sessions that they do, the, um, uh, the uh, zero-hour contract fitness instructors uh, also perform tasks like refilling vending machines um, and they also attend additional training sessions on uh, equipment use, uh, fitness and health, uh, fitness uh, or health and safety. So quite a lot is actually asked of the fitness instructors considering um, you know, the low hourly rate that they actually receive. So I would not be surprised if they're pretty uh, cheesed off with their current employment conditions. Yeah, I want you to think as well of F1 IAS 36 impairment of assets as it would relate to um, the breakdown of machines and having to write off certain uh, equipment at the end of the year for damages, etc. So keep that one in mind as well. As I say, these machines are likely to be used more often than in other uh, higher end gyms because of the volumes coming in uh, to these gyms. And that's going to have an impact on the money spent on repairs, the money spent on uh, replacing these, these machines too. Gym man managers, the manager and assistant managers, are actually empowered to independently run their own gyms. They have power over setting membership fees and there are bonuses linked to gym performance. So they're highly incentivized uh, to get their gyms performing as well as they possibly can. And they're well, uh, they have a lot of freedom to make decisions. So they need to be uh, highly qualified and cap capable people. Other employees are given competitive pay rates. They have a contribution pension scheme in place, defined contribution pension scheme in place, and they're able to participate in share incentive plans. So as I said before, there seems to be two classes of employees. Uh, you have the uh, the poor old fitness instructors on their zero hour contracts and you have the uh, fixed staff on their cushy um, salaries. They're participating in the growth of the company through the share, and share uh, plans, etc. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's plenty of resentment on the part of the fitness instructors. 
And we talked a little bit before about the lower need for reception and sales staff, for example, due to the electronic entry system and the technology that's in place for signing up for new members, etc. Uh, also, the fact that cleaning, security and uh, machine maintenance, big repairs are outsourced to specialist companies. And by outsourcing to specialist suppliers, you can presumably drive costs down there as well. It is important, though, that you hold those um, uh, outsourced, uh, these, those external suppliers, uh, that you hold them to account and ensure that they, there are targets in place. Think of your E1 studies, uh, service level agreements. You might want to draw up a few of those for the different uh, suppliers, external suppliers that you have, so that there are consequences in place for them not meeting um, the uh, requirements out, outlined in those uh, agreements. Now, Reflecting again on what we've seen here with the staff uh, and relating it to your E1 studies, HR management. Think of personnel management uh, compared to HR management. With personnel management, you're talking about a very basic approach to human resources, uh, just looking after what Hertzberg would call hygiene factors only. So, um, looking after, just ensuring people are paid, uh, you know, uh, enough to uh, not complain, etc. But not going much uh, ab above that. There are things that are expected by employees nowadays. Um, and ideally, if you do value your staff and you say that they're a key part of what you do and a key asset, um, you would move to something more akin to HR management, where you're looking to more powerfully um, motivate your staff. You want to establish the right culture um, because you want to attract high quality people and you want them to stay with you and you want to avoid uh, resentment building up, you want to avoid disputes and you want to keep people in the company for longer. And I don't think it seems that uh, that Gym Fit is doing that, at least with their fitness instructors. And I think they would do well to consider uh, moving to more of a HR management approach. Okay, then the senior management team that we're presented with uh, on page six, um, we're told that the senior management team is actually. Uh, not so senior, they're relatively young, they're very enthusiastic, and they have a can-do attitude. Uh, you know, that's great. Certainly that's uh, needed at a, a, a company that's trying to pursue aggressive growth. There is perhaps a danger that there will be a little bit of inexperience and over-enthusiasm if things go too far, which could lead to uh, indiscipline and the company uh, biting off more than it can chew. Is, it is there a danger perhaps that they could take on too much debt as they try to open more and more gyms uh, as quickly as they can? So keep an eye on that. Before we work through uh, this section, I want you to think of corporate governance, which you came across in your E1 studies as well, uh, and ask yourself uh, these questions. Uh, are there likely to be sufficient checks and balances in place uh, at the highest levels of the company? Do they have uh, sufficient internal controls? And uh, is there a, a, an audit taking place each year um, of the processes of the company? Certainly, um, it would be necessary to audit the financial statements. That's a requirement of being uh, listed on the stock exchange. But you can go further and in, uh, audit your internal uh, processes, for example. Is there enough independent scrutiny of the company, which would lead to the next point there? Uh, non-executive directors, are there enough non-executive directors bringing their outside experience uh, and independence to bear on the uh, executive directors of the company? There's no mention on the senior management team of non-executive directors, and there's only a little bit of mention in the next page of two non-executive directors, which I don't think is enough for this company. And a lack of experience in the team. We've already seen that this is a young management team. Uh, so that might be a potential problem. Okay, Bertram Durand is the CEO of the company. He's been there since 2014. Does have extensive experience in the leisure and fitness industry. 
And as we work down through these uh, senior managers, we'll see that most of them have experience in the leisure and fitness industry, which might lead us to ask whether this uh, senior management team would do, uh, could do with a little bit more outside experience. Someone coming in who is experienced of another industry could present a different perspective and that could be of value. So maybe if they're bringing in new non-executive directors, for example, they would put an emphasis on someone with experience in another industry besides leisure and fitness. Nicola Collette is the CFO, 45, qualified accountant, and she played a big part in uh, taking the company public. So um, she deserves a credit for that. Relating to your E1 studies, the value chain, remember that finance is a support activity. It's not a primary uh, activity. Jessica Treewood, 38, again quite young for a, a senior manager at the company. She's the marketing director, which uh, marketing is a, a primary activity uh, on the E1 value chain. She came from a competitor. So again, her experience is within the uh, fitness sector. The operations director is someone who has actually worked his way up through the company. Uh, so he has uh, experience as a lowly fitness trainer. He's worked his way up to uh, be operations director. He's still quite young, 38. Uh, and he's looking after the running of the gyms, but also the HR function. So he's got a dual responsibility there. Um, and uh, you think again of E1, uh, system implementation and change management may well be key considerations for this uh, kind of role as this uh, person, Ethan Henson, looks to improve the running of the gyms. And if there is need for big change in the way that the gyms are currently being run, uh, you would think of something like Lewin's change process, which may be quite uh, useful in meeting um, resistance to change and uh, uh, getting past that if employees are unwilling to change that you would unfreeze uh, this uh, resistance to change then you would move and refreeze by locking in place new uh, desired practices for example. Jared Fisher is the uh, property director and that's an important role because this company is a large portfolio of, portfolio of properties uh, for each of its gyms and he does have a little bit of external experience he worked in the hotel industry which uh, where property management is also obviously very very important so he's the only director on the senior management team with external experience outside the uh, health and fitness industry. And finally, we have Gemma Schneider, also very young, 36, the youngest member of the senior management team. And she has a very important role to play as the IT director, given the fact that IT plays such a central role at this company. And in fact, she is very keen to further develop IT systems with the assistance of her team. They seem to be very innovative, highly qualified, so they're a very competent star, uh, staff and a big part of how this company uh, is achieving growth. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him on exam day uh, reference to upcoming investments in new IT systems uh, and new technology as this company uh, tries to grow and steal a march on its competitors. In fact, one of its competitors is even more tech savvy, it seems, than Jim Fit, and we'll come to that in uh, a few pages' time. Okay then, the organisational chart that we're presented uh, with uh, on page 7 presents us with a fairly typical functional business structure where similar activities are being grouped uh, together. You have the operations uh, director with the operations team sitting under him, uh, property team, marketing team, etc. So they're kind of working in, in silos there. Um, but... Uh, there are pros and cons, just like with any other um, uh, organizational structure. Uh, the pros of a functional structure is that you would have uh, all of the, uh, the activities uh, grouped together. So you have a lot of specialization taking place. So the marketing colleagues will all be working together, pulling in the same direction. They'll be, become very specialized in that area. They'll, uh, they'll establish the best standards and best practices 
uh, and they'll learn from each other quite quickly and become more efficient in that way. The danger, though, with this kind of setup is that uh, teams tend to be work in isolation from other teams, and there isn't a lot of communication between different departments, and that can lead to conflict between areas. So they're protecting each their own little kingdoms and looking to get resources, limited resources and budget, for example, for their own uh, little departments rather than working uh, for the good of the company overall. They can lead to longer chains of command as well. Um, so um, these are some of the disadvantages of a functional business structure, as I said. Um there are there is reference here to non-executive directors Paul Swallow and Carl Mann. So there are two, but I do think there is more of a need for non-executive directors. You want to balance out the number of exec- executive directors in the board with an, uh, an equal amount, ideally, of non-executive directors. The idea is that the non-executive directors will represent the interests of shareholders and keep the executive directors honest and offer them guidance and ensure that there are checks on their uh, their power. And in the final part of this section, uh, we see the finance department headed by Nicola Collette, the chief financial officer. Under her sits your boss, Stephen Potter, the finance manager. And under Stephen are three finance officers, including you. Just a word on the advice that you do give on exam day. You need to ensure that it's ethical. Always make recommendations that um, demonstrate um, demonstrate that you're, you're opting for the right option, that you're not cutting corners ethically or anything like that. And I do think that ethics will be an issue in exam day. We've already discussed the issue with the freelance fitness instructors Uh, But uh, anything else could come up. You might be asked, for example, to present figures in an overly optimistic light to satisfy shareholders, for example, by one of the other directors. You'll be expected to do the right thing. Remember the SEMA Code of Ethics. You want to conform to its principles of objectivity, professional competence, confidentiality, professional behaviour and integrity.